Hello, I am delighted to be joined by, well, my cat here, who's decided to get involved. <laughs> Hi, Keir. Great. Always great timing. Don't stand on the keyboard. Uh, to be joined by the brilliant Gary Stevenson, who I haven't interviewed, actually, for a long time, but it would be deranged if I didn't interview him, given he is, as things stand, the author of an absolute runaway success, which is The Trading Game, A Confession. Um, I mean, actually, just to be clear, this is the number one, it's been twice now, the number one bestseller on the Sunday Times bestseller list, which is an astonishing achievement. That means, in in layman's terms, selling a lot of books. That's what that means in, in layman's terms. Um, and it really has just struck so much of a chord. I think there's, I think, kind of some form of Gary mania sweeping the nation. <laughs> um, and, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a book which is, it's, it's a brilliant piece of literature. It's kind of memoir, it's politics, it's economics, it's lots of stuff. But it's also, you know, class, masculinity, loneliness, addiction. Um, it's just one of these books, which I think in generations to come, the look, you kind of look back at certain books and think, you know, how, what was the moment they were living in? You know, what kind of, you know, and this was, that will be this, that kind of book where people go, you know, let's try and understand the insanity of the 2020s unless we wiped ourselves out in a massive nuclear apocalypse and combined effects of the climate emergency. Anyway, hi. <laughs> how are you doing? Good to see you again, Owen. It's been too long. It has been too long. It has been too long. Right. Just so people aren't aware um, uh, of you. Um, because what you do at the moment, you've got this brilliant, do make sure everyone you check out his uh, YouTube channel, a rival YouTube channel. No, not at all. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Gary's all Economics. Companies. Exactly. Gary's yeah. Economics, um, uh, which it does what it says on the tin, really. Um, and what's so fascinating about Gary is it, it's it, you've got quite a unique origin story, I would say, in terms of uh, the because you're obviously trying to teach people about actual economics, how the economic system in which we live works. But how you got there is is quite something. So I want to start by, because you were, we'll talk about how you became a city bank trader, the most you know successful one. But mm -hmm. you came from an East London working class background. Just tell, talk, me, talk me through that. Talk me kind of through your background, because just so everyone knows, this is key in terms of going from there to the next world, in terms of how we understand the world in which we live. So just start, start with how, how you, you know, you'll talk about your background. So I grew up in Ilford. Ilford is kind of slightly distant East London slash Essex suburb. Um, Central Ilford, where I grew up, is one of the cheapest places to live in all of London, which is why my parents moved there from South London. Uh, you know, small terraced house on a street full of small terraced houses. Um, railway line running through the backyard. I was sharing a little bunk bed and little bedroom with my brother. Um, that kind of poor upbringing, basically, you know, kids playing football in the street. Um, very, very immigrant area. So I grew up with a lot of British Indians, British Pakistanis. But obviously, being in East London, we we were sort of, we could see when the Canary Wharf skyscrapers grew up. And we had, obviously, the wealth of London surrounding us. Um, I passed my 11 plus when I was 10 years old. So I went off to a grammar school and sort of started going to school with much better off kids. And I think I, I always sort of grew up aware that we were poor and, and wanting to make more and sort of seeing these skyscrapers go up on the horizon and thinking, yeah, I want to get in there. I want to make money, which, which I think is what most kids, to be honest, from my sort of background want when they're young. Now, I was suggesting in terms of how you ended up, let's just talk about, let's talk this through because, um, you know, some would look at you and go, okay, from working class background, mm -hmm. in East London, made it in the city, the system works. Yeah. So just talk about, you know, in terms of your education and then how you ended up um, at LSC. Yeah. Um, and yeah, let's just go for kind of like that that kind of surroundings. What what it was, you know, you went from this particular, you ended up at LSC and the sorts of people you were surrounded by. Yeah, when I was writing the book, I was going to start it when I first started at City. And then I went and I read Liars Poke, which is sort of the big classic finance novel by Michael Lewis. And he talks about how he got the job. And I thought I have to put in how I got the job because the way I got the job was, was so mad, basically. So I was a very... A talented math student when I was a kid and I, I won a few competitions when I was a kid and um, I was very good at math I always did very well in my exams and I kind of I, I went on to study maths and economics at LSE um, and I thought if I did really well in maths I would get a job um, it wasn't that simple I got expelled from school when I was 16 for selling drugs and I uh, got kicked out of the grammar school I had to go back to the local comprehensive I studied hard managed to get into LSE so for those who don't know because not everybody knows what LSE is LSE London School of Economics is a super prestigious economics school in the center of London. And um, 
it, everyone's heard of Oxford and Cambridge, but really LSE is basically basically just as good in terms of getting you into the top jobs. And it's really the place where very wealthy people from all over the world, especially in poorer countries, people like India, China, the Middle East, Latin America, so they send their kids to LSE to you know study economics for a couple of years, go work for Goldman Sachs for a couple of years, and um, then go home and run the country, basically. And um, I got in there, and it's a very kind of a crazy place full of like kids of billionaires from all over the world but I just thought I'll get my head down I'll do my maths and I'll get a job um, you get into second year and basically everybody goes absolutely mental totally mental people start wearing suits coming into university in suits they stop going to lectures all, all they do is apply for internships 30 internships 40 internships different investment banks and um, I was super confused they, they start talking like another language yeah. CDS's MBSs, MBO, CDOs, MA, all this stuff. I didn't really know what to do, basically. So I start talking to my friends. They say, Well, you've got to apply for these internships. Problem is, in second year, you don't have your grades yet, right? So, so basically, what you, you're applying on what they call CV and cover letter. Mm. But you know, at that, you're 19 years old. All you really have, everybody's got straight A's at A level. So, all you've really got is your extracurriculars. And all of these kids have been being bred to have the best extracurriculars. Like, since they were kids, they've all like, founded some random charity or been head of the junior united nations or you know played oboe at the royal albert hall this kind of stuff when i was a kid i was fluffing pillows at dfs in in beckton east london retail park you know so you realize straight away like there's no way basically i'm gonna get in and um i was quite depressed and i started really focusing on my maths i got kind of recognized basically for being good at maths one day in the library kid from grimsby I can't use the real names. In the book, we call him Luke Blackwood. Just turns up. I never met him before. He said, are you Gary Stevenson? Citibank hires one trader a year through a card game, which is basically a maths game. You know, I heard you're good at maths, so you should go into this game. So this is the trading game. It's the, it's the, um, the game which gives the book its title. And um, I won it, basically. And I suppose in hindsight, one of the reasons why I won it is because this guy, Luke, had told me the rules. But I think there's kind of a beautiful irony that you know, I was one of the number one students at LSE. And we, we live in a world where if you are the best math student at LSE, but you come from a working class background, the only way to get a job is to cheat in a card game, <laughs> which is what I did. And, and I won. And that's how I ended up in the sea. I mean, you ended up there in 2008, just months before essentially a nuclear bomb exploded in the global financial system. And of course, we're talking about the 2008 financial crash. We still live in the shadow the long, dark shadow of the 2008 financial crash. In lots of ways, the world partly forged by that mm. autumn in 2008. But you were there a few months before that happened. And just tell us, you were in something called short-term interest rate lending. Mm -hmm. what, what the hell is that? And what kind of ends up being the significance of that? Very simply, it is, it is the trading of short-term loans. So it's the borrowing and lending of money for a short period of time, um, we, we would manage anything up to two years. There'd be mm -hmm. another desk for longer loans. But a lot of what we did was like literally one day loans, one week loans, one month loans, super, super short term loans. And this was a very unfashionable area of trading before I went into it. So you've got to understand, you know, back in the sort of 80s and 90s, we had this sort of Cockney wide boys going into trading just after the Big Bang. But by the time I turn up in 2008, Really, it's the same kind of guys who are going into LSE. So it's, it's kids of the international elites, lots of people from wealthy families, private schools, private universities. But they weren't going into Sturt trading because it was super unfashionable. And um, Sturt was kind of a bunch of older guys and the kind of young guys who were so like socially awkward that they couldn't get a job on a more popular desk. And um, <laughs> I kind of loved these guys and, and they loved me. And they, they came in and said, if you work on our desk, we will let you trade from day one. And this is really unusual. Normally, when you go into an investment bank, you're sort of doing training schemes and doing exams and rotating on desks for like two, three years. You're probably not going to be trading until you're sort of 24, 25. These guys were like, you can trade from day one. So I said, yes. I turned up on this unfashionable desk. Then 2008 happened. Lehman happens. Suddenly, nobody in the world has access to dollars. Everybody needs dollar loans. Everybody needs to borrow dollars. And none of the long-term lenders are lending. The only people who are lending dollars are the short-term lenders of dollars, which is basically us. And what happens is this desk of kind of unfashionable traders suddenly becomes unbelievably profitable. And it was really, it's, from my perspective, it's so crazy because you go in, the world is kind of obviously blowing up. All of the credit traders over there are losing their jobs. 
And all of these sort of old fashioned, unpopular traders around me are suddenly making millions of dollars. And they suddenly, and obviously I'm sitting there thinking, how do I get me some of this basically? I mean, that's interesting. I mean, in terms of just, just before I just ask you about the what happens next, I'm just interested in terms of just being in that environment where you're just suddenly thrown in the deep end. You know, as you said, working class lad from Milford, shared a bunk bed, right away through the back garden, and all of a sudden, you're there, you're a city trader, surrounded by, I mean, what was it, did you feel imposter syndrome? I mean, how did you feel? Did you feel <laughs> like, it's just like, what, or what the hell is going on? Where, you know, just in terms of, having you know all of a sudden this yeah completely because de- i you know lots of people would find that a completely alien world to just yeah be thrown in and then off you go well as you know i know i'm not really the imposter syndrome type <laughs> um the thing is Correct. you know i was I, I was the top student at lse even though i came came from you know a pretty poor background you turn up on the trading floor there's a lot of wealthy people there i always remember when i was an intern one of these guys paid me and my mates milford to go and paint his flat and his flat was enormous, three floors. He had no doors, he had rotating walls. And, you know, he was from private school and you could see these guys were like very well off. But they were pretty obviously not geniuses. You know what I mean? I remember when I went in, I started to, I, on my first day on the desk, I spoke to a couple of guys and I had no idea what, what they were saying. And then I spoke to like one of the juniors and I was like, I spoke to JB and I spoke to Rupert and I've got no idea what's going on. And he said to me, I oh, don't worry, they've got no idea what's going on either. He goes, this guy behind me, he's the stupidest guy I've ever met and he makes millions of dollars a year. So like, don't worry about it. And um, I think, obviously, it's very easy to be sort of awed by these wealthy people. But, you know, they weren't geniuses, Owen. And I, I know, was sort it, of... It, it, I mean, this is so key to understanding what happens, isn't it? Because the reason I ask, I mean, partly it's extremely... Impossible syndrome is extremely common amongst uh, people from working class backgrounds. Yeah, when yeah, yeah, yeah. Oxford or Cambridge or elite professions. But for you, the cure fit was... The emperor has no clothes. That's that's what protected you, wasn't it? It was a, ba- a ba- confidence in your own abilities, clearly justified. Yeah. But it was a case of look at these people. They're not actually the incredible godlike geniuses. Maybe they like to think they are. Yeah. Well, I mean, also the world had just blown up, right? And these guys yeah. are supposed to be economists, and like nobody had predicted it, right? So I think they've kind of even the, this of the universe. Already, that's what they were known as. Yeah, yeah. You can already you can already kind of see like. They, they didn't really know what was doing. It was the banks that blew the world up. So I think, I mean, I think I am quite un- unusually willing to sort of accept that the, the so-called geniuses don't know what they're doing. And I don't know where that come from. Uh, my parents are Mormons. I was sort of raised in like almost a religious cult, you know. So I think I sort of had to accept early on the idea that sometimes big groups of people <laughs> don't really know what they're doing. And I think you, you spend any time in economics, you step back and look at them, you realise, yeah, I think, a lot of the top economists, a lot of the top traders, there are some good guys in there, don't get me wrong. But especially mm. back then, um, it wasn't for the geniuses. So so why not me? That was what I was thinking. Now, you made your first million aged 24 years old. Mm-hmm. How? What the hell happened? So, you know, in, in 2008, when everything blew up, um, I wanted to make some money and I just sort of start. You know, it, I think it's like quite a typical career trajectory in a sense. You come into the place, you don't really know what's going on. You try to make some friends to teach you what you're doing and you try to sort of copy what the people around you are doing. And in my first year, I I had a very successful first year. I made $12 million for the bank and I got paid £400,000 myself, which was way, way more than I was expecting. I just turned 23. Um, but then in my next year, this kind of crazy thing happened. The Swiss National Bank cut its interest rate to minus 4.5% in a really weird way. I lost a ton of money. And um, it sort of got me realising... You can't just sort of copy away to success. And so by then, we're in the beginning of 2011. I've been a trader for a couple of years. You know, I spoke about how the 2008 crisis wasn't predicted. What I think is really even more interesting is how the post-2008 period was really horrendously predicted. So in 2008, because rates were cut so quickly, almost everybody thought we'd get a really rapid recovery. It's really similar to what we saw during COVID. 2020, 2021, when rates were cut really quickly and everybody was saying we're going to have a roaring 20s, we're going to have a V-shaped recovery, there's a load of pent-up demand. It was a really similar story back then. Everybody was like, we're going to have a massive recovery in 2009. 2009, obviously, that didn't happen. Everybody was saying, okay, well, we're going to have the massive recovery in 2010. 2010, it didn't happen. We're at the beginning of 2011 now and everybody's saying we're going to have a massive recovery again. 
So here's me, beginning of 2000, I'm 24 now. And I've basically, all I've witnessed is everybody be wrong about everything for my entire career, which is three years now, which is quite a long time. And I sort of started to think, you know, this is op- these guys don't know what they're doing. And I, oh. I, I maintain that to this day. Most economists and most traders, they're really misreading the, the big economic picture. And I wanted to understand why. So the theory is when you cut interest rates, ordinary people like the guys watching this now should go out and spend money because there's no point saving. It's easy to borrow. You should spend. Businesses should spend. But it didn't happen. That whole post-2008 period, it just didn't happen. And um, I was lucky enough to work with um, this really amazingly good trader, a, a scouser, who I've called in the book Billy. Didn't come from any con- a very working class background. Work- worked his way up from being a cashier at Halifax. And I spoke to him about this. And um, my instinct was to go back to the textbooks. And he said, listen, mate, you're not a kid no more. Mm. You're not going to find no answers in them textbooks. If you want to know about the economy, go home and ask your mum about her financial situation. Walk down the high street. Look at what shops are closing down, what shops are opening up. Look at the advertisements on the tube. Right? You ask your friends and your friends' families about their financial situations. Basically, the economy is the real world and you have to go out and engage in it. So, so I just did a simple thing. You go back and you start trying to engage with people and you ask, ask them, why don't you spend more money? Why don't you spend more money? And, you know, the people watching will know what the answer was. You know, nine out of ten people said, Gary, I don't have any more money. I'm spending everything that I've got. And then... I wasn't happy with that. So I sort of dug into their financial situation. And what I saw then, I was in my early 20s then, a a generation of parents who owned their own property and a younger generation, my generation, who in most cases will never own property. Mm -hmm. So what you have there is families, their long-term wealth trajectory is down towards zero. Mm -hmm. And it makes no sense to ask these guys, why are you not spending more money, right? They're on the way down. They're losing their assets. They're going into debt. This was the beginning of 2011. And around about that time, I got called into a meeting by one of Citibank's best economists, a guy who I did actually respect. And he went through the financial situation of all the world's major governments. So Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece, Ireland, but also the UK, the US, Japan. So some people might not remember, 2011 was another massive financial crisis Mm. where basically we found out that a lot of the world's major governments were in some ways effectively bankrupt, basically. Mm. The, The governments were doing the same thing that the families were doing, spending more than their income, going into debt, selling off their assets. And I come out of this meeting, what really struck me was, number one, the the similarity between the families and the governments. And number two, the impossibility of it. Because it's not possible for all of us to lose our assets at the same time. And it's not possible for all of us to go into debt at the same time. Somebody has to get the assets and somebody has to be owed the debt, right? And this was rattling around in my head. And I'm sitting on the trading floor, you know, surrounded by millionaires. I kind of have this penny drop moment where I realize this is it. This is the problem. The wealth is flowing from the middle class, from the government to the rich. Mm -hmm. The next step after that is, well, if governments can't run a balanced budget when they're not in massive debt to the rich, well, what happens when they are in massive debt to the rich? Mm -hmm. And if ordinary families can't run a balanced budget when they own their own homes, what happens when they don't own their own homes? And I realized immediately this would spiral out of control and get worse and worse and worse. And, I think what I say in the book is basically economists were then and I think still are now diagnosing a terminal cancer as a series of seasonal colds. Mm. There is a fundamental structural crisis here, which is we are bankrupt in our middle class. We're bankrupt in our governments. That wealth is going to the rich. It will never come back and the economy will never recover. And I, I put a massive bet on that interest rates would stay zero for the next sort of three years, which was nobody expected that at the time. And by the end of the year 2011, I was Citibank's most profitable trader in the world on the back of this phenomenally pessimistic bet. And I've, I've kind of been riding this very simple understanding ever since that there is a structural crisis of inequality. It is not a recession. It is a permanent worsening crisis. I mean, just on that, because I mean, we'll obviously that's what I really hugely want to talk about. Quantitative yeah, yeah. easing at the time, because this was, you know, where the government's, but they're buying up bonds to increase the money supply. Yeah. And that, you know, that was a vast, in theory, that was a huge amount of money going into the economy. That's what, that's yeah. how it was seen. That that would be one of the key. So what the hell happened with quantitative easing in that period? Because that is something you understood, basically, because yeah. you were there in what I suppose we call the real economy. You were looking, you know, you were there, you weren't off, you went from some privileged background where you're thinking about what are my friends in the ski chalets of 
Switzerland yeah. thinking and doing and all the rest of it, which is what a lot of your peers would have been doing. So what was going on in quantitative easing? So in quantitative easing, the central bank, it, it, it buys government bonds. So let's break that down a little bit. The government is in debt, okay? All the world's governments are in debt, um, especially now, especially since COVID, government debt is very large. Um, what we often don't realise is they are in debt to somebody. The, the total government debt, if we if we add, if we include the individuals who hold the government debt, is, is always zero. Total debt is always zero. It's not possible to be in debt to nobody. So if the government is in debt, somebody is owed debt. And of course, some of that might be in pensions of regular people, but it, in many cases, it is the, the large lion's share is held by the rich. It's held by richer people. Central bank buys that debt back off them and gives them cash instead. So now what you have is a load of rich people with a load of cash. Okay. And of course, you know, in many ways you could you could argue, okay, this should be good for the economy because rich people have got a load of cash. But in, in reality, if you give rich people a bunch of cash, what do they do? They buy the assets. They buy the assets. And, and you know, rich people as a whole, if they are buying assets, then somebody needs to be selling assets. And who are the weak holders of assets? Well, it's the government and the middle class. So what you see, you give the rich people a bunch of cash. All they do is they buy the assets of the middle class. They buy the assets of government. And what you then see is a massively indebted government. And you see the middle class losing their homes or middle class going into debt. I think it's so, so similar to what I was raving about in 2020 at the beginning of COVID. When we saw governments running massive deficits going into the economy. And I'm not against those deficits. I'm not even necessarily against QE. But if you're going to pour a ton of money into the economy, somebody somewhere has to say, who is going to end up benefiting from this money? Who mm. are the net benefiters? And, you know, I would encourage anyone who hasn't watched it to watch the very first video on my channel, um, which is called How the Rich Get Richer from COVID-19, which went out in June 2020, saying, listen, this enormous amount of money that's being poured in, I'm not against it, but it will end up with the richest people in society. And if you give money to the richest people in society, they will buy your stuff, <laughs> you know, and it's, you know, distribution matters, you know, so... I think QE, same as government COVID deficit, is that there's a massive blind spot in the minds of economists and economic media in terms of talking about who are the winners and who are the losers. Because, you know, if, if we stand, sit here now, we know now with certainty that the government spent £800 billion deficit since COVID. Somebody's accumulated £800 billion. Well, that's £16,000 per adult. So if it's not you, if you're out there are not £16,000 richer, someone else has got it. All the statistics show it's with the rich, right? We knew that would happen in advance. So if I was to say to you now, imagine we pause the economy, which is effectively what we did in COVID. And during that pause, we enormously increase wealth inequality. And then we unpause the economy. What do you think will happen to living standards? The obvious answer is living standards for the rich will increase and living standards for the rest will decrease, yeah. which is exactly what happened. But nobody spoke about it because nobody's talking about inequality. And it was it's, what drives me mad is, as you say, we have seen this film before. Mm -hmm. We've made this exact same mistake in 2008, which is, yes, you have to pour this money in. You have to pour this money in. But you should also ask the question of how will it affect the distribution? Because both 2008 and COVID were managed systemically in such a way that they massively increased the wealth and the cash holdings of the richest. They massively increased inequality and they immediately led to a fall in living standards. And it's, it's wild to me that economists and well, I would say traders, though traders don't speak publicly. It is wild to me that we do not speak more about the distributional effects because now we're left in a situation where the government is in a massive amount of debt. All of that debt is held by the richest. And all of the statistics show us the last five years have been the biggest increase ever in the wealth of millionaires and billionaires. So if, if we don't want to close the government down, we basically have to tax the rich. But because nobody talks about the increased wealth of the rich, we're left in a situation where... Many people think we have basically no choice but to end the welfare state. And, and that is what happens if you bankrupt yourself to the rich and pretend you can't tax the rich. So I think we have to talk about distribution. I realized that in 2011. We made the mistake then. We're making the mistake now. And the reason why I do what I do now, the reason why I wrote the book is because I think the only chance we have is to get ordinary people out there realizing that unless you reverse those increases in inequality, living standard falls are irreversible, but they are reversible if we deal with inequality. This is what's so striking about your thesis, because a lot of the time on the left, the argument against inequality often seems quite a moral argument. And that's often been quite easy for the right to take on. I mean, it's it's fascinating, actually. Um, well, I mean, one example, under the new Labour period, Peter Mandelson once infamously said, 
were intensely relaxed about people getting filthy rich so long as they pay their taxes, though in practice tax avoidance was rampant then and, and continues. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher in her last Prime Minister's questions in 1990, so she'd just basically been removed, and that was largely in the midst of things like the poll tax um, and internal schisms over over Europe, but the poll tax movement, I think, was instrumental. But she she um, she gets this question from Simon Hughes, who was then, you know, in what became the Liberal Democrats, um, or maybe they'd become the Liberal Dems by then, uh, taking on the increase in equality in her reign. And, and she goes, you'd rather that it was, and she starts gesturing with her hand, she, you'd rather that, you know, if the poor, you know, people, the rich are less rich, but the poor will be poorer, but then you'll be happy because it's less inequality. So she's like, you'd prefer it to be like this with the poor at the bottom there rather than this. So the argument she was making, and has been the point about Thatcher's, is why don't you, why do you care about people becoming rich? Because everybody else will also become richer. They won't be as rich as those super rich, fine, but their living standards will also rise because huge prosperity will be created because those rich people are getting rich because they're taking risks. We've freed them from the dead weight of the state and they're making a shed load, but you will benefit. And the whole point of your thesis is, and you, you back it up by the fact you made a packet out of it, is that isn't true. That's mantra isn't true. It won't lift all boats just because though it, it does the opposite. And that's how you yeah. made your money. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm... I'm in quite a sort of fortunate position tactically, right? And it, it weirdly becomes because I don't consider myself a political person, you know. I consider myself a very good economist. I've got a very good track record. You know, I was Citibank's top trader in the world. You can go and you can look at the predictions I made in 2020. They all came true. You can go at the predictions I made in December last year, January this year. They've all come true. Um, I'm a good trader and I, I'm good at making predictions. Because I understand this one simple thing, which is the distribution matters. And look, if you've got high inequality or even growing inequality in a rapidly growing economy, and you know, the rich are creating a, a whole load of wealth, and the you know, you know, for example, in early the early USA when sort of the rich are creating this wealth, but if you're poor, you can just go and find go west and find more land, you know, maybe it works. But you know, once you reach this kind of developed saturated low growth economy then where does the five percent compound growth of the rich go they basically end up with no choice but to eat the middle class it's not because they're evil they, they have no choice but to do this and i think the, the most amazing thing in the last sort of 20 years is we see this falling wealth of governments that's extremely visible if you look at the statistics we see this falling wealth of the middle class the property the middle class we see that disappearing and we see the exploding wealth of the rich and we don't connect the two things. It's, it's sort of, you see, it's like if one bathtub is draining of water and this other bathtub is filling up with water, and we just think these two things are completely separate phenomena. But, um, well, there was yeah. a really interesting uh, 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 paper, an academic paper yeah. fleshed out in 2021 called Indebted Demand. Three heavyweight economists, Princeton, Harvard, Chicago. Yeah. And they argued income inequality and financial regulation led to indebted household demand. Households spend less because they have high levels of debt, rich ho uh, households tend to have higher savings from the bigger slice of the nation's wealth that they've been handed. Uh, so they noted that debt owned by households and government have increased almost 100 percentage points of GDP, which is the economy, gross domestic product, since 1980. So with poorer households landed with more debt, their debt payments mean a transfer of money from poorer borrower to a richer saver. And they say, when demand is insufficiently indebted, the economy gets stuck in a debt-driven liquidity trap uh, or debt trap. So that's that's the point you're making, isn't it? This is the what you were talking for years and years and years, and there you get, and then you know these top academics putting it, fleshing out exactly what you were predicting for years. That was the basis of why you made that money. Yeah, and I've got a lot of respect for these guys. That's me and Sufi, yeah, and um, Ludwig Straub working with them. No, I've got a lot of respect for these academics. Um, most the thing you need to understand is what in universities, economics departments. If you study economics, uh, your undergrad, masters, the mainstream macro models you will learn, which you will spend 90% of your macro time on, uh, don't include any inequality. You never look at inequality. So economists have kind of been trained not to think about this. And these, ac these academics who have been sort of broad minded enough to think about it. I've got a lot of respect for them. Um, but look, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. You, you can see the loss of wealth of the middle class. And I, I think we're so naive about distribution. During COVID, the economy was literally paused literally paused and you give a ton of money to the rich you know 
how naive are you? Can you be to think that giving an enormous amount of money to one group, you haven't created any new resources, that that will not disadvantage other groups? Mm. I think, um, but this is sort of, I think in a sense, what you have here is kind of the inevitable endpoint of these kind of Thatcherite arguments that you make, which is there's no such thing as society. We are all individuals. We all have to sort of tend our own gardens. That has allowed a small group of families to become extremely powerful, extremely mm. wealthy. Our kids are competing with their kids for assets. Okay, so right. Rishi Sunak is worth, according to the Sunday Times, 700 million pounds. His father-in-law is much, much, much richer. Mm -hmm. If you have 700 million pounds, you will make a passive income of something like 30, 40 million pounds a year, nearly a million pounds a week. What are you going to do with a million pounds passive income a week? It's impossible not to buy the rest of the assets. You know, and our kids who don't make a million pounds a week are competing with Rishi Sunak's kids for ownership of the property. Listen, Rishi Sunak's kids can't live in all the properties, but they can own all the properties, either via direct ownership or, via, or through the mortgages. You can't compete with these guys. You cannot compete with these guys. And I think this, a problem we have, I think, is these ideas, these Thatcher ideas that you shouldn't look at the rich. You shouldn't, you shouldn't think about the rich. You should just focus on yourself. You should focus on yourself. You're playing the same game as them and you're competing for the same assets, right? They will win that game. You cannot compete with guys on a million pound a week passive income. You cannot. We're in a situation here. The way I see it, you're basically being invaded by an army of people who are much more powerful than you. But there's many more of you than there is of them. Mm -hmm. And you're saying, listen, don't worry about that army. Tend your own garden. Listen, tending your own garden does not work when you're being invaded. The rich will take everything. The rich will. And you're seeing it in front of your eyes. How can we have this situation in the last five years where normal living standards collapse? Wealth of the rich increases. That money comes from government and nobody connects the two things. So the whole thing that I'm doing with the YouTube and with the book is trying to explain to ordinary people the reason you are increasingly poor is because of growing wealth inequality. And this is not a moralistic argument. This is an argument that I use to make millions of pounds trading the markets, to make correct predictions again and again. If you don't believe me, right. read the book, look at the predictions. The, the yeah. proof is there. Which is why you're, you're so unique because there are... I can, you know, there were the dissident economists and all the rest of it making arguments and so on. But you're someone who actually, your bank balance literally exploded because you you made the right calls. I mean, just in terms of Liz Truss was right, wasn't she? That's uh, just hear me out before. It's, yeah. So, okay. So where are we going with this? Well, in terms of when she said she had an analysis where she said growth has been stagnant since the 1980s, and though she didn't seem to understand that, which is why there was a pretty strong caveat there that. Um, the 1980s was when we had the sorts of policies she pursued and tried mm -hmm. to pursue, um, obviously, and in, in, in caused the crisis back in uh, whenever it was, 2020, 2022. It's been a long few years. Mm -hmm. um, in that, it, you know, the best growth that Britain had was in the 1960s, uh, post-war growth on average. Um, in the 1980s, which, you know, we had the same average GDP growth as the 1970s, which is seen mm -hmm. as when we're the sixth man of Europe, but it was less equitably distributed. The 90s was even weaker average growth yet. The noughties, even weaker growth yet. The 2010s is about the same. And, well, this decade is not, not, not going that well, is it? So, I mean, it's, mm. it's like, we're, I mean, we're locked into both low stagnant growth, which is inequitably distributed. The economic model is bossed, isn't it? It clearly is just bossed. I mean, you say that. Well, I, I did a master at Oxford, 17 to 19, you know. I actually, people won't believe this. I worked quite hard not to use my face and my name on this campaign because I didn't want to be out there telling the Guardian I'm a millionaire, you know. Mm -hmm. doesn't make life easy on Tinder. But <laughs> I was at Oxford for two years asking these professors, why do you not talk about what's happening to living standards and what's happening in the real economy and how people can't afford housing, how people can't afford jobs? And these guys said to me, what do you mean? The, the economy is good. The economy is good. You, you, you know, you're sitting in a wood panelled hall wearing a bow tie and a cape with a bunch of guys who are millionaires saying the economy is good. And I think a, a big part of the problem is a crisis of inequality looks great from the perspective of the rich. But we are in a situation now, you and I both work in the media. You know, you will see media, academics, central banking, high levels are dominated by people who are rich and from rich families, right? So you, you reach a situation where ordinary people can sit, ordinary people in many, many cases are legitimately struggling to simultaneously feed their kids and turn the heating on. But everyone in the debate 
is seeing their wealth explode. And, and because they only look at averages, you know, the averages are showing, OK, growth is slow, but positive inflation is coming down. They think that life is good. But if you actually look at what's happening to different groups in society, the rich are exploding and ordinary people are, are blowing up. So for, for you and me, and I suspect for many of the people in ordinary financial situations who, who are watching and listening to this, they can see the economy is collapsing. But, you know, maybe you will experience the same thing. You talk to people in high levels of finance, high levels of economics. They think things are great because things for them are great. I mean, this is the point. I mean, you're, it's such a damning indictment of the whole economics profession, what you're talking about here. I mean, you're, you mentioned because you, you went you did you went to Oxford and did a master's degree in economics. Um, and you, 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 you asked the senior economic uh, economist there about their view about why people weren't spending. And you got this pithy response. An exogenous shock. Exogenous to, shock, yeah. yeah. Exogenous shock to consumption savings preference. So what that means in practice, something not in our economic model. So yeah. basically they couldn't understand, they were not able to explain why people were not spending. They had no explanation. So they came up with that when rather than look at, for example, inequality. And that says a lot, doesn't it, about the economics profession? Because yeah, they're not yeah. trained to talk, they've been trained not to talk about that. And therefore well, they've come up with something... I went to this guy's office and I said to him, you know, this exogenous shock to consumption savings preferences. That is just meaningless. It's a meaningless phrase. It just means something. People will understand that. And it's best because I think if you understand it, you literally become stupider. But like, it literally just means something happened. You might as well say God did it. Right. And I said to him, if that's what you've come down to, why don't you just go and ask people? Why do you not just go and ask people? Why don't you spend more money? And he literally said to me without a trace of irony. That is not what we do. Simple as that. That is not what we do. And I think some people think that some people expect me to be like furious at the bankers, furious at the traders. You read my book, you'll see that there's a few unpleasant traders going around. These guys never pretended to be the good guys. Hmm. These guys were never supposed to be the good guys. These academics, they drive me mad. Their lack of connection, their lack of care, the lack of curiosity and the lack of empathy for what's happening to ordinary people just... Of course, there are some good guys. You know, you mentioned this paper by yeah. Atif and Mian. And, um, but they're, is, so, it, is it just, isn't it? Because what's happened to the economics, prof um, sorry, academy is a lot of those ended up in places like geography departments and elsewhere. You've got this overrunning of uh, the economics departments in universities by people of a similar mentality. And if you want dissident views about economics, you basically have to go to a different department. Yeah, I mean, these, these huge walls of maths have been built now such that unless you are really like a very, very good mathematician and also a very patient mathematician, because you have to endure a lot of boring memorization to go far in economics, oh. it's just not accessible to you. You know, to be honest, we've reached a situation where really 95% of people are basically not allowed to study economics at a high level because they don't have a certain level of, of mathematical ability. And I, and I think that's ridiculous. Um, but, you know, what I would like to see is a situation, you know, I, I wandered onto the trading floor as a kid from Ilford. And within like three years, I was famous because I was making good predictions, you know. But in academia, my ability to outpredict these guys is meaningless. They don't even care. I think, I think one of the most amazing things I've witnessed in my life is I could probably still today walk into any one of those skyscrapers. I'm talking to you from close to Canary Wharf, get paid a million quid a year. I would go and work with these professors for free. I would go and work with the government for free. And they're not interested. And I think that tells you it's such a damning indictment of the way that we have created our economics profession. You know, and I talk in the book about one of the last word of my acknowledgements is I would like to thank God or whoever it is who made it so easy to bet on terrible things and so difficult to stop them. You know, why is it that kids like me from poor backgrounds who have excellent records of predicting the economy are worth so much money to the banks and are of zero interest to government? It, it makes no sense. And I, but what it is is, the rich will pay people like me to manage their money. Yeah. But governments, all they care about is winning the next election. You know, you look, Rishi Sunak is worth 700 million quid. David Cameron made 10 million quid within a year of leaving office. Tony Blair is worth like 100 million quid. You mm -hmm. know, I would like to ask a question to, to the British people and the people of the world watching this, right? If the people whose job it is to protect you and to protect the economy are definitely not going to protect the economy, whose job is it to protect the economy? Because I know people out there will be thinking, look, I'm just an ordinary guy. I'm struggling to get by. This is not my job. I'm sorry. The fire brigade is not coming. The job, the people whose job it is to fix this, I'm sorry. 
but they're not going to fix this. And I know you have your gripes with Labour and maybe we'll get our time to talk about it. They're not going to fix it. Well, that, that's fix. what I just, that, that's the last part I want to talk to you about, obviously, yeah. in terms of what happens next. So the Conservative government is is dead in the water. There's going to be a general election and the Tories are facing a apocalyptic electoral situation. There will be a resounding Labour situation, which is why I think personally people should vote according to their conscience because they don't yeah. have to vote for the Labour Party and the Labour Party will still win. Uh, so they should vote Green or Independent. Anyway, just plug that. But the point, just in terms of what Labour are arguing though, so Labour, contrary to Keir Starmer's uh, a, a leadership uh, pitch, aren't going to increase taxes on anyone who's doing well, uh, economically prospering. They're not going to, yeah. they've ruled that out. They've even suggested they might cut taxes yeah. on, on those at the top. Um, and they're put, they they say they're put, they're throwing everything at growth. That basically what will happen is um, they'll come to power, and they I mean they had a plan in theory for growth before twenty eight billion pound a year um, investment plan, a green investment plan, but they they trashed it. Um, so now they're talking about house building. That's their big thing. They'll they'll reform planning laws, um, and that will cause a big um, explosion of houses being built, and that will generate growth. I think that's basically their thesis. So, what's your view on that? Because they're saying they're, they're one of their commitments is they'll have the fast Britain will have the fastest growth of the G seven countries. Those are the key industrialized countries. For those who don't know, what's your thoughts on what they're uh, what Labour are saying and what and, and what you think yeah. where you think the economy is headed? Listen, I'm not against growth. I think economic growth is is generally good in, in, in almost all cases. Not all cases, you know. Economic growth is good if you can get it. I think we've reached this kind of ridiculous point in society where economic growth has kind of become a code word for I am an idiot with no plan. It's become a mantra. It's like the ohm of our days. It's, we're just going to we're going to hope our way out of it. Listen, yeah, this is like I walk into the doctor's office saying, doctor, I've got cancer. And he says, have you tried fucking growing? You know, it's it's listen, it's not going to. This problem is so severe now. The growth in economic inequality is so severe now. It will spiral out of control. And, you know, my concern is we could get the economic growth, you know. But in, in a capitalist system, and I don't consider myself an anti-capitalist, the growth will work for the people who have the money. You know, so what you will get, if you build a, a ton of houses in London, I'm not against house building, right? If you build a ton of houses in an extremely unequal city, you will build a super luxury centre surrounded by slums. Go, just go to any unequal city, you know, go to Sao Paulo, you know, go to Manila, 25 million people in Manila. They built a lot of fucking houses. You know, I mean, did it make life better? You know, but look, I, I don't, you know, I don't personally know these guys in Labour. I've got no, I've got no grudge against them. My concern is we have a massive problem of inequality that no one is addressing. And we have centre left parties in power in many countries all over the world, in Germany, in Spain, you know, arguably in America. Living standards are falling in all of those countries because they're not dealing with inequality. The problem is bigger than Labour. The problem is bigger than Keir Starmer. The problem is a broad problem of understanding. You need to deal with the growing inequality. If you don't, you will not improve living standards. And my big fear in this country is that Labour will win the election. They will not do anything to stop inequality from growing. Living standards will continue to fall. And a general public who has already lost faith in the centre-right will lose faith in the centre-left, and in 10 years, will be in fascism. That is my concern. That's genuine. Because... I mean, we can see, just so we're clear, I mean, it's not fantastical, that is it, given Donald Trump, which I think certainly his movement is heading in the fascist direction, is in, has a very good chance of winning the presidential election. So that's the biggest the superpower. Um, in France, the National Front, uh, oh, sorry, the, the National Rassemblement now, whatever they're called. Um, Le, Marine Le Pen has every chance of winning the next presidential election. Yeah. In Austria, the far right ahead. In Germany, where you may mention a government of the sort of Keir Starmer vibe politics, yeah. um, that, that government is chronically unpopular. And the AFD, um, the far right party there, are ahead of, for example, the Social Democrats in many polls. Yeah. Um, we can see in places like Hungary where they're already in power, essentially. So yeah. in Italy, they have, you know, a, a quasi far right government. Yeah. In Portugal, the far right just surged. I mean, yeah. it's not looking good. So you think basically in terms of where the economy is heading, as things stand, you just think basically this is a embedded into the model because of failure yeah. to deal with inequality. Therefore, in it, the living standards are just going to keep on stagnating. There's no way around Listen, that problem. Oh, and I wish they would stagnate. They're collapsing. 
living standards are collapsing for ordinary, and you cannot allow living standards to get worse and worse and worse year after year and keep promising people jam tomorrow. You know, they're not idiots. They're not idiots. People increasingly know the ship is sinking. They're losing faith in political parties who continually promise growth and all they deliver is falling living standards. They're losing faith in the media, which keeps telling them it's one, two years of recession when people can clearly see it's 20 years of continually worsening living standards. And they want an alternative. They, they, and, and they have every right to demand an alternative. They have every right to demand an alternative because they can see the ship is sinking. More and more people can see that. And they are demanding an alternative. And it's, I think it was Milton Friedman who said, in times of crisis, the alternative will be chosen from the ideas lying around at the time. And yeah. everybody can see what the loudest and most popular alternative voice is which is the problem is immigrants, the problem is foreigners. That is the loudest alternative voice. These guys will increasingly get power. It will not improve living standards because they're not dealing with the fundamental problem of inequality. And then they will say, well, the problem is we didn't go far enough. We need to go further. And people like you and I need to be providing an alternative that says, no, the way to improve the living standards is to decrease inequality. It is to tax the rich higher and to tax you, ordinary working people, less, provide better services and allow you to keep more of your money. But... That voice is not there. You know, I, I see a lot of the left is not providing this alternative. You know, if we do not provide, listen, politics will change massively because living standards are collapsing. People will demand an alternative. You know, the party in Germany is literally called Alternative for Germany. People want an alternative. The centre is collapsing all around the world. Whoever is the loudest alternative voice will win. And you and I both know that at this point, the left is nowhere near as loud as this anti-immigrant movement on the right and we need to have a voice that says we can improve your living standards and the only way we can do that is by reducing inequality and you know labor will win and they will not succeed in improving living standards in fact living standards will continue to fall we need to address that i believe the only way to do it is to at the very least stop inequality from rising and you know i would encourage yourself i would encourage the listeners to take this message home with you think mm. about whether you want to believe it and if you do you know, amplify my voice and share it with your friends and your, and your family and say, listen, there is an alternative here, which is reducing inequality, taxing the rich, taxing the billionaires, cutting our taxes. I think that's our only chance, Owen. Just finally on that, because I, I just that's why I want to kind of leave on. I mean, it, is it, that point you made, I think, is also really interesting in terms of what yeah. we know is the cost of living crisis, because in the four years before the financial crash of 2008 under a Labour government, um, the incomes of the bottom half began to stagnate and of the bottom third, they actually began to decline 2004 to 2008. Because I yeah. think obviously we understandably see the cost of living crisis is something which is kind of a post crash austerity kind of period. But that's not it's not true. The, it, the seeds were, were sown before that. So it's obviously embedded in the labor in the economic model and labor was in power when it began. So really important. Yeah. Point. Just funny. I mean, that's the point, I suppose. A lot of people just feel a bit despairing, to be honest. They they can see, look, they I think anyone listening to this can go, this guy knows exactly what he's talking about. He's been vindicated yeah. in, in horrendous ways for um given what that means for everyone. But it, it's it's you know, we've got now basically two lost decades of living standards. Um yeah. it's an astonish historically unprecedented, the longest squeeze in living standards for working people since the Battle of Waterloo. Yeah, yeah. So, but people think, well, what the hell do we do? Because, you know, because they can see all the, the Trump demagogues and all the rest of it waiting in the wings. Yeah, um, yeah. And people feel a bit powerless. So, you know, how do we get this message across? What do we, how do we do it in the way you so eloquently do? And do yeah. make sure you check out the, his YouTube channel because he does explain these concepts in such a way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, let's, let's give people something to be hopeful about because I know my message can be depressing, all right? Um, a couple of years ago, I, I worked with this group called Patriotic Millionaires. I didn't make, make the name. Um, and they sent me up to uh, North Yorkshire, to Rishi Sunak's constituency, when he was still chancellor, to go to a food bank and ask people, how do you feel about having the richest ever MP as your chancellor? It just totally randomly happened that a couple of days before I went up there, Russia invaded Ukraine. Mm. And it totally sort of you know derailed what I was doing because I went to the food bank and it was full of people um, like putting sorting food and warm clothes and medicine and toys into all these different bags and they were they were sorting them chucking them into vans and they were going to drive them themselves to ukraine it's just a it's like a military barrack city so they've got mm. like vans and drivers and um it kind of you know it messed up what i was going to do because i wanted to go and talk to food bank users you know and, and in the end it, it become like a sort of community hub so you know i'm there sort of helping chuck into bags and being force fed about six cups of yorkshire tea and um I get talking to the people and um, I'm asking, them, how do you know about this stuff? And the people who were there chucking this stuff into bags, 
with the food bank users. These are the guys, the food bank users, the, the, wow. the poorest people in this country. When they sensed that there were people in need a thousand miles away, they stepped forward to help. And um, listen, you know, I see a lot of people shit on this country and talk down on this country. And I would never turn around and say this is a perfect country or the best country in the world, but it's my country. And you go to a place like this and you see that there are good people in this country who are willing to step forward and work for something better. And I think if we give them something to work towards that is hopeful, mm -hmm. that promises a better life, they will come and support us. And it's the job of people like you and I, Owen, and, and the people listening to provide that story, to provide that narrative. People want something new. People want something different. And it doesn't have to be negative. It doesn't have to be hopeful. And I think if we can tell that story, then they will come and back us. And that's why I do the work that I do. And I'm sure that's why you do the work that you do. And I hope people will support me. And, you know, you know, if you can't afford to buy the book, you know, the YouTube is there. It's for free. It's for free. It's out there. And, you know, we can make it better. We can make it better. And I believe that. And I wouldn't, have, you know, I gave up a lot of money to do this um, mm -hmm. because I think we can. So, uh, so I would encourage everybody out there to, you know, pull your socks up. It's going to be hard. It's going to be a long battle. But if enough people do it, we can win it. Amen, brother. And that is the, the lesson throughout history when sufficient numbers use their collective power together, um, they can force change. And that's how we want all our rights and freedoms and peril as they are. Uh, but there is more of us than there is of them. I think yeah. it's a really important point. And um, it's a beautiful book, everyone. Do make sure, you, if you can, The Trading Game, A Confession. Um, if you can't afford it, do wait for paperback, obviously. But it's yeah. a brilliant, brilliant book. Do check out uh, Gary's Economics on YouTube where he you can hear he's a fantastic communicator, one of the most important voices we have right now. Um, and we need desperately <laughs> the voices like Gary, if only we could uh, clone him. Well, not clone him, because they're <laughs> the same guys. The same, just lots of different people like Gary in di different ways. That's what we need. Um, and there are brilliant people coming forward and being inspired by people like Gary, which is also what we need. So I hope people listen to this as well and think, feel inspired to speak out and use your voices and your platforms as best you can. Do make sure you get the training game, A Confession. Um, it's available all over the place. Uh, Gary's Economics. Uh, please like and subscribe on my own channel if you haven't. Um, leave your comments, um, even the abusive ones I read. Um, <laughs> and uh, listen on the podcast if you're not already, if you are. Uh, but thank you very much to Gary. Cheers. Thanks, so much. Keep doing what you're doing. Here's what we